Now, as we, we've talked about in other parts, you know, and, and recently, you know, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of missions being planned. Is there any vision for how many stations are going to be needed to support all this? Or is it just kind of a, as you said, a bit of a chicken egg problem. As we build more, we just have to build more of these. Yeah, that's basically it. Uh, if you go to Europe where they have uh, plans for networks as well, but they're talking on the order, you know, 10 to 15 ground stations because they have cloud everywhere. <laughs> and so in order to get availability that's high enough to make it worthwhile, they have to have many, many ground stations. Um, yeah, it's really the more you can build, the, the more will get used. Okay, so Francis, we have our telescope working. We're getting our laser data from the moon and astronauts up there and they send a video. Where does it go? Like, do you see it on a screen or like, you know, <laughs> how does it actually work? So I think a lot of people have no clue and part of myself included how that gets to data on a computer. Yeah, well, so the, I guess the data itself is transmitted in this case by turning a laser on and off. So you're looking for the intensity to go up and down so basically you take the light that the telescope collects, you put it on a detector, which can measure when the light is on and when it's off. And then that gets decoded into your digital signal. That then goes to where it needs to go. So it could be stored for later use. It could be fed out through a fiber optic network for you know, live TV coverage or uh, stream to the internet, something like that. And uh, that's, yeah, that's how you do your data transmission. And so I guess it's not dramatically different than if we were to take this telescope and point it at a star, for instance, right? That light arrives on a camera and a detector, a CCD, and then we interpret it and then we get an image on a computer later. So can this then communicate to different types of data? Can you do videos and photos, but can you also transmit communication signals, for instance? Yeah, so it's really everything in one. You have a piece of electronics like you have at home, the modem, and that takes whatever digital data you have, whether that be an image or uh, some scientific signal or a video or whatever, and converts it into a particular stream of ones and zeros, which gets translated into the optical signal that's transmitted over free space. And then at the other end, you have the same thing. You have a detector which detects those ones and zeros you have your modem, which then reverses that and puts that back into its original format. And then you send it off to whatever mission or person wants that data, and they're now a happy customer, I guess. Exactly. So when do you expect this kind of, at least this facility, as you said, there's already been some tests, to kind of be online and operating and staring at the moon? Is, is there a deadline because, hey, this astronaut is on the moon at this date, you better be up, or? Yeah, 2024. <laughs> uh, so Artemis II, uh, the second Artemis mission from NASA, one of the crewed missions to the moon, um, will have an optical terminal on it. And so there are uh, stations in the US that will be doing that. Uh, we're looking uh, if we can support that here in Australia as well with this exact telescope. Yep. Uh, so that's the deadline for that. There are missions going up all the time from different partners across the world. So it could be from uh, Europe, it could be from the US, Canada, uh, Japan, a whole range of countries have laser communications missions going up. Uh, we'll be able to support a huge range of them uh, with this capability. Well, yeah, and, and when those missions go up, uh, how do they actually tell you to point to it? Do they call you at night and be like, hey, Francis, you know, can you give us some data? Does it have to, is going to have to be programmed weeks and months in advance? I kind of assume so, but, you know, is there any logistics detail that are more surprising than other? Yeah, the logistics is, is quite complex and is usually sorted out quite well ahead of time, particularly when there are astronauts involved. They already know what they're doing today, every minute of every day. <laughs> um, you know, the launch date might be uh, uncertain, but what they're doing is certain. Um, when you're talking about other um, uncrewed missions, then that's usually something that is, is sorted out as, you, as the mission progresses. But you basically have a plan of what you're going to be doing and when, and you have to queue up all of the resources you need on the ground uh, to match that plan. And so when you're budgeting a mission, are they going to have to pay you? Is this going to be a free service? So again, when we visited Tidbinbilla, you know, that was paid for by NASA because they're paying for all the missions and then they also do it for other countries. But because you're not part of NASA, is this on behalf of NASA? Is this, you know, going into your bank account? You know, <laughs> I assume not knowing how research worked, but you know, is this an Australian space agency led project for instance? So I guess it's led by the ANU and uh, we would be looking for funding from the Australian Space Agency for certain aspects 
of the hardware to go onto the telescope. And for actual use of it, commercial companies are certainly welcome to come and use and rent time. We have a model for how that'll work and what it'll look like, um, you know, beyond the telescope, even across the network. And it's relatively cost effective. All we really need to do is be able to run the telescope for the research. So we're not making money off it. It's just enough money to keep the lights on and keep it pointed where it needs to point. And, and I think, you know, we, we've explored this earlier in the course of the economics of space and how so many of these other things you have to deal with. So you're really just thinking about how can you make it a useful tool to the community and do your research and cut even, right? You know, that, that's the name of the game is not profit, but keeping the lights on and the bills paid. Exactly. That's really all we're after. Yep. Well, and, and I think that's kind of the exciting thing about how this advances. You know, this isn't, you know, it's a big project, but we're not talking about building a hundred or two hundred million dollar facility in a new place. This is one of the many things you do, you know, I wouldn't say on the side, but it's one of the many projects. And this is kind of one of the futures of space communication. Yep, absolutely, especially on the deep space side. Uh, I think we're really excited to be working with the likes of NASA um, and other space agencies to be able to, you know, receive their communication signals here in Canberra. Great. So that's a bit of the practical side of building a new station to, through lasers, uh, talk to astronaut videos in the future on the moon. Uh, so thanks, Francis, for kind of explaining it and showing us your very new shiny toy. No worries. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah.